Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to thank you for being here. Um, I think you will agree that we just had a pretty interesting session there. Um, you know, you can't lose when you bring uh, the people who are responsible. Can you hear me okay? Let me say that. Okay. People who are responsible for the creation of and implementation of policy that impacts the lives of our children and ultimately our community, that we have that opportunity and we've had that today. I just want to explain that that first session was set up to lay the foundation for the ultimate discussion, which is taking place in just a moment. Keep in mind, I'm not the focus of this. We have the unique opportunity of having the superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools with us here today. I want you to give him a hearty round of applause because he could be somewhere else. Follow what we did earlier, that second panel began to fold into the racial equity policy, which not for the cultural, historical, and all the other kinds of adjectives you could put on it. Was the adjectives right, Dr. Polio? Was that you? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that, that there wouldn't be a racial equity policy. So that speaks to a reality, does it not? Next, we had very key players. We had the chairperson of the Jefferson County Public Schools. And I might add a very clearly dynamic and dedicated chairperson, knowledgeable. And we also had the interim commissioner of education who did not hold back but used the opportunity to express clearly his position and how they would interact with each other to going forward. I thought that was significant. But now, now we have the individual who has a whole army of individuals that he's responsible for but the individual that is going to guide this community through its educational processes in the public arena. That's Marty, Dr. Marty Polio. So you see the progression of how we got to this moment. So I'm going to, first of all, um, ask Dr. Polio, if you will, to say anything he wants to say. Before I dig into him, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to hand this over to him because I want him to express himself uh, as he chooses. Senator Neal, thank you all for being here. And I will say, um, I don't have anywhere else to be right now, but I do have some place to be in a couple hours. So I'm trying to pull the ticket out of my pocket from the uh, for the football game here in a couple <laughs> hours. <laughs> Anybody want a ticket? So, I will definitely be going there. I have my Cardinals gear in the car, and I'm just going to go straight to the game. I'm under this, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just being too positive. I'm under this impression that all of a sudden we're going to start moving the ball up and down the field for the first time we're here. But I'm losing hope, and I'm going to stick with it for a little while longer, we're hoping. So go Cards. Um, so thank you for being here today. Um, clearly, right now, we are in a spot um, where we have a distinct opportunity. And so, you know, I've been in JCPS for over two decades. This is my 22nd year in JCPS, um, almost exclusively in high schools. I can tell you the high schools that I worked in. I was a teacher uh, and a coach at Shawnee High School, the same at Wagner High School. Um, I was an assistant principal at Wagner. I was a principal at Jefferson Town High School and a principal at Doss High School before stepping into the acting or excuse me, acting superintendent role and then eventually superintendent role. Um, it's been well documented that right now, uh, JCPS in recent years is what some would call it in a crisis situation with the um, state audit and then the recommendation for state management before our agreement. 
And at no time in our community do I ever believe that we have had more engagement in public education as a result of what has happened here. And so we can say that, yes, it's hard, it's been hard times for us. And I can tell you the last 15 months um, for me has been very challenging for our board as we have gone through this process. Change is difficult. But some positives. First of all, as I said, engagement. I don't know if two or three years ago, if we had had this uh, type of crowd for a public education forum. So what an incredible crowd, a room full of people who are coming to engage and listen and learn and hear about public education. So that's a real positive that, that we need to make sure that we capitalize on. Second of all, there has never been a period in JCPS, at least in my 22 years in this district, where our community, and I say the JCPS community, and many folks around the JCPS community have been more galvanized than right now. We have a unique and a distinct opportunity because for the first time in my 22 years, I have felt this um, real togetherness when it comes to teachers and administrators, central office, schools, parents, uh, community, where first of all, there is some pride in this public school system. Yes, we acknowledge we have a lot to fix and work on, there is no doubt about it, but there is a galvanized feeling that we have the ability to do something special. And third and finally, I say this all the time, and you know, it, it can be considered a little corny in a way, but I have said this multiple times to our school board members and to administrators in our district, this is our 60 Minutes moment. What I mean by 60 Minutes moment is that in three years, I believe we will have the opportunity to be highlighted on a show like 60 Minutes for the changes in what we've done to our district, our community, how we work together as a community, and where many um, cities across the nation, their public school system has been dismantled. That will not be the case in Jefferson County. We will change outcomes for students and we will have the opportunity to highlight a great district. And I say they don't highlight districts or do stories about great things that have happened from districts that were pretty good and then became good or average and became pretty good. They highlight districts that might be in crisis. And when I say that, you know, and I'll talk more about this, uh, there's a lot of great things going on in this district. There's a lot of great things, and I'll highlight some of those as we go on. All too often, we get we are the punching bag, um, and that's going to stop soon. But we have a lot of things we need to fix. We have good things. But I know where we have been in the past year and where we are going, I believe in three years we will have our opportunity to have great celebration about what we've done as a community for public school students and our outcomes completely changing. And I think that's our 60 Minutes moment. So I'm excited about this time in our district's uh, history and what we're doing. We've got a lot of work ahead. I believe the foundation has been laid and that we will see um, great change in this district in the years to come. So uh, just very excited for the opportunity to be here and to talk to you about that foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Uh you mentioned that 60 minute piece, but why should we trust you to do things differently? Why should we trust you to create an outcome that has not been achieved historically, I would argue, in Jefferson County Public Schools? Why you, Dr. Polio? Well, I mean, I don't know, I would agree. I don't know if you should just trust based on words. I mean, I think it's going to be more about actions and what we do um, in order to, to make change. Um, what I would say is you can look to the foundation of what has happened in the past year just based upon what we have um, begun to build. I will not say it's there. Um, but a year ago, a little over a year ago, for instance, um, Dr. Marshall, who was here earlier, began to talk to me about a racial equity policy, which is only in about seven to ten districts across America. And quite frankly, not in districts 
in this area of the country um, and came to me and said, you know, first of all, we have to acknowledge our deficiencies specifically around outcomes for students of color, achievement gap, uh, disproportionality. We have to acknowledge that. We have to put a plan in place. Um, and that plan is around this policy where every single employee, every single school acknowledges their data and their problems and begins to roll up their sleeves and make plans about how that's going to change. And we talked about it, but we said there is, that's really going to be a difficult hill to climb. That we would not, that there, the community, our community as a whole, might struggle politically to accept that. And I said, well, let's go on that journey. Let's see if we can get it done. And nine or ten months later, whatever the amount of months, it passed unanimously by our board seven to zero to begin this work. Um, so, I mean, that that is, I believe, groundbreaking is what we're going to do. Now, it is just a policy. And the work has to happen. It is difficult, challenging work to ask principals, to ask teachers, to ask schools, to ask central office to do things differently than they've ever done them. But we see it happening now. Um, second of all, um, you know, I believe that our backpack of success skills and our specifically targeting students to say you are going to be transition ready. You are going to have a foundation in math and reading that is going to prepare you for your next transition in school. You are going to have those deep engaging opportunities um, that many times uh, students of color do not get because they're in a certain zip code, they're in a certain school, or they're in a certain program within a school. And we have said we are willing to tear down those walls and make sure that that doesn't happen. I believe that program is going to, man, that initiative is going to transform this district and will be a model for other districts to come. And then finally, we have to be committed um, to our facilities improvement in this district and we might get a little more into this but I will say this I believe that the facility a student walks into no matter what community they live in um, within Jefferson County is symbolic to the child about how much the community cares about them in their education and so if a child is walking into a school and bright and shiny is just not the answer. I'm not saying it's the only answer. Bright and shiny and innovative and um, science labs and desks, um, computers, all of those things. I'm not saying that's the only answer. But I do believe there, that is a symbol of our commitment to a student about how much their education means to them. And so we are coming to a time in the very near future where this community is going to be asked the question, not just Marty Polio saying we need to do this, this community is going to be asked the question, are we willing to uh, put our money where our mouth is and renovate and build new schools in every part of this community so that when every student, no matter where they live, what zip code, they are walking into a school that shows our commitment <coughs> Um, and belief about the importance of their education. So, I wouldn't say um, necessarily trust me. I would say see the plan, hold me accountable. I believe we will be there in a uh, short time. It's, it is a lot of work and, and a big lift to do, um, but I think that for the first time ever in a long time, we are saying here is the plan, hold us accountable for implementing that plan. Well, <laughs> trust is a big word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why I raised that. If you look at this thing historically, there's little to trust. But you raised a question there, and you made a statement there that I think is the key to that, and they call it accountability. And you seem to have invited that, and I, I think everyone appreciates that. So what do you see the community, in fact, the people that are gathered here today and beyond, what do you see as their role in relationship to what you have to do in order to become successful? So first of all, uh, when I say accountability, um, 
I, th I think that's the first level of it. And, and I think this requires a superintendent and staff that is willing to sit in front of you and answer difficult and challenging questions about outcomes for students and our plans moving forward. Um, and so first of all, I would say as a community, be very engaged. Be very engaged in what's happening. Uh, Ms. Porter said at our last session, come to board meetings. Um, be knowledgeable about what is happening in our district and what we are doing. And I think that is the accountability part that is so important. For the first time ever, as a part of our racial equity policy, we have an advisory council uh, that is not just words, but I have to go to on a quarterly basis in front of this advisory panel or council and report how we are doing and our uh, indicators of success and are we making progress along the way and questions about policies. And so community members being at those meetings and being a part of that is going to be so important. I would ask also our community members too, uh, be advocates for JCPS and supporters of JCPS. Um, as I said earlier, I know it is very easy to pile on with many of the issues that we have had. Um, but I would ask that we need community members, and we have many in this room right now, that volunteer um, and give their time and energy for no money whatsoever, but just because they care about public schools and our kids. So be advocates for JCPS. Hold us accountable. Being an advocate doesn't just mean being a cheerleader and not saying we are holding you accountable for outcomes. But hold us accountable and be supportive and be advocates for JCPS. Um, you know, as much as possible, I am going to every single forum, no matter what side of the political aisle that might be, to be a champion for JCPS and the plans that are taking place and making sure we are successful. I would ask you to do the same thing and be there with us uh, and champion our schools, whether it be here, whether it be in Frankfurt, whether it be in churches or community centers. That's what we have to do. So the, the two biggest words I would say for that is to be um, hold us accountable, but also be advocates for our public school system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds like an open invitation. It is. Well, let me tell you, the African American Initiative, uh, the forum on which you're speaking, speaking now, as you know, is a policy group. And one of the things that we do, we don't just hold meetings. What we do is we form policy teams. And what we do is we invite those that we deal with, let's say such as JCPS, to join us into a collaborative relationship. Uh, to look at in a very positive, sometimes critical, but always toward moving the, the needle forward um, to get a better outcome. Is that something that uh, you would be open to going forward with respect to Jefferson County Public Schools? We're reaching out to you now. Definitely. Um, you know, I think being engaged in policy, um, especially in regards to statute, is so important. Um, I wasn't here for the, um, uh, the, the part earlier around our racial equity policy, but an important part of our racial equity policy um, is what we call the REAP. And really analyzing any policy, any statute, and we, we are not obviously at JCPS about policy and not statute, that's Frankfurt, but how it impacts marginalized students, students of color, um, and so all too often we have passed policies across America in school districts and at state levels <laughs> without really analyzing and acknowledging the impact that it could have on certain groups of students. And all too often that students of color, um, students of poverty, and marginalized groups of students. And so we have been committed to say if we are going to implement a policy, how is that going to impact those students? And instead, we need policies that are going to reduce the achievement gap instead of increase them. And so I would ask some of the things you've heard today. We have to have those questions around that policies, the policies from the state level, and ensure that these policies, statutes that are implemented, 
do not impact students of color, um, students of poverty in very negative ways. And so I think being engaged with Jefferson County Public Schools um, in that work is so important and we definitely accept that invitation and want to be a major part of it. Outstanding. You know, Chair Porter, uh, in her presentation earlier, mentioned funding. And I perked up when I heard that because that hit on one of my key areas of concern. Uh, you know, I don't look at Jefferson County Public Schools uh, singularly when it gets to whether there's adequate and inadequate pro uh, funding. I'm looking at the state. You see, the state comes in and says we need to do A, B, C, D, and E, and they correctly point out uh, a number of deficiencies. But the state's role in funding is a big deal. One thing I've learned, there's really nothing new under, so, under the sun in terms of methodology as it relates to educating our children. The question is, do you have enough resources to address the unique situations that occur in these systems? I want to know if you agree with that. I think I already know the answer. But I want to know if you agree with that and how does funding affect your ability to get outcomes that we want to achieve that we haven't been able to achieve thus far? So first of all, let me say this. It is imperative on us to be very good stewards of taxpayer money and ensure that every dollar that is being spent um, is spent wisely and impacts student achievement and outcomes in a very positive way. So I will not step away from that and say that we don't have to look at every dollar we spend and possibly repurpose certain amounts of money or certain funding back to schools. I will own that and I will say that and in this next budget process um, we are essentially starting from scratch because each year prior to this it's kind of let's just build our budget based on what we've done in the past and I see board member Horn back there who is a champion for finance and budget and um, and is the one that always asks the question rightfully so around this um, but we are going to have to make some significant decisions around how we spend dollars and repurpose them. There is no doubt we have to take a look at our central office and decide if, if every person, if every dollar spent in central office could be spent better at a school. Now what I found many times is services as central office, if removed, can impact schools in a negative way. So it's a fine balance. And I know we have a lot of educators in here who have worked at schools and central office and they know that balance and so but we have to examine that however one of the biggest problems that we have is that number that likes to get thrown out at us which is that 1.7 billion dollars that how can you not be successful when you have this money but if you examine that number with the amount of students we have it is no different than districts our size that are our peer districts. We have peer districts that look very much like us, that are the size of us, and we find we are equivalent and sometimes even less funded than those schools. And per student, it fits right in with other Kentucky schools, despite the fact that we have much greater need than many of our peer districts. There is no arguing with the fact that we have approximately 66,000 students who qualify for free or reduced lunch in our district out of 100,000. Now wrap your head around that 66,000, two-thirds of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch in this community. We have 13,000 students who qualify for special education services. We have well over 6,000 English language learners and growing. And I'm proud of that. We love to have them, but obviously it requires increased amounts of funding. We have 6,000 or more homeless students in our school system right now as we speak. And so we have significant need. On top of that, we have over a billion dollars in facility needs. If you didn't know this, the last high school that was built in this community turns 50 this year. They are having their 50-year reunion this year, 50. 
We have a high school right down the road from here, about 40 blocks west, that has a floor that was condemned a quarter of a century ago. So because student population was decreasing in the school and there were significant facility needs on the third floor at Shawnee High School, the decision, and I was a teacher there after this in 1997, and we all knew the third floor is condemned. And one of the first things I did as superintendent say, take me up there, it's an entire floor of a high school. And the debate might be, well, there's not enough students there, you don't need it. But once again, I will go back to symbolism. Imagine you're a school, a student entering Shawnee High School on Monday morning, and the students know this, that there is a third floor that is condemned. It is symbolic to our students. So right now, because of property assessments, about 75 cents of every tax dollar in Jefferson County goes from SEEK funding, which is in the early 90s as a result of CURA, which was to balance out funding, 75 cents of every dollar goes to another district somewhere in this state, <clears throat> even though we have this significant need. So our actually, when you hear that SEEK funding has remained the same, yes, it might have remained the same, but because of um, economics and finance, which I'm no expert on, we have actually lost money um, from state funding to education in the past two decades. So we have significant need. We are either going to have to make some decisions where Frankfurt is going to give us more of those fundings, or we're gonna to have to find ways for alternative sources of funding in this community to make significant differences. If you go into other cities that are like us, many of them, and go to some public schools, you will see very different facilities than what we have. And so these are changes we are gonna to have to make. I will say this when it comes to our budget next year. I believe this. We cannot send students home on June 1st anymore that need additional support in math and reading and ask them to come back in August 15th and hope that somewhere along the way they've improved in math and reading. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, along with our backpack of skills, when June 1st comes and we have, we're gonna start with elementary schools, if we have 5,000 elementary school students who are not on track to be transition ready for middle school. We can no longer hope that something happens. We have to provide a minimum of a six week learning opportunity, and I'm not saying they just go into their school and sit in a desk and do the same thing they did. We are going to be asking the community, how about if the Science Center allows 200 of our elementary students to come five days a week six, uh, uh, for six weeks, we provide the transportation, we pay for the teachers, half of the day they are doing engaging fun science activities, that's one example only, but the other half of the day we are supporting reading and math. But the price tag on that folks will be $1,500 a student. $1,500 a student, 5,000 students, we're looking at $7 million. But we have to ask, are we willing to do that? Do we have the the, the determination and the courage as a community and as a school district to repurpose seven million dollars and do that. I believe we do and we will do that. But those are the kind of programs that are going to have to happen to make a difference. I agree with you, Senator. The methodology is there's not something new that's going to pop up, but instead we have to be willing to do the tough things that are going to allow those changes to happen, which is going to require significant amounts of funding. I hear, I hear two things. I hear we talking about here's how much we have and we need to work within what we have to do the best we can. And I also hear, but looking at the challenges that we have, we really don't have enough to deal with everything we have to deal with. Did I hear that right? Yes, you heard okay. that right. Okay. so. I, I notice I have my colleagues, my legislative colleagues uh, are here, uh, Representative Darrell Owens and Representative Reginald Meeks, who fight with me on a daily basis almost, challenging the state to meet the obligation of CURA 
in 90, which it has never fully met. And at the same time, if you look at the funding of the last time we were out, we are funding at the level back to 2008. So let's dig a little deeper here. Specifically, what kinds of programs has the state backed away from that you can identify that are key to what you need to do going forward? We know there's not enough money coming in from the state level. We know that you have to work with what you've got to be as efficient and effective as you can. But what specifically from the state level that you can identify that we've backed away from that you think is key to the success going forward? So clearly, as you said, seek funding is a major issue. You can go back to 2008 um, and no increase in funding at that time. And we will hear that seek funding might have increased. But at the same time, last year, there was cut in uh, elimination of professional development funding. Um, and so I just wanna, I wanna stop on that one for a second. Right now, in education across America, we have a crisis around the hiring of teachers, an absolute crisis. So I don't have the exact figures nationwide, but what I can tell you are the amount of um, teachers, certified teachers coming out of our university programs have been cut or declined greatly in the past decade. And so we have vacancies right now. And so every time we hire a teacher and we don't have the funding in order to develop those teachers and support those teachers and a teacher quits as a result of that, that is going to significantly impact student learning. KTIP, KTIP, the program that is designed to support brand new teachers was completely eliminated. Textbook funding has been completely eliminated um, from uh, for schools and so now school districts are required to have their own textbook funding so anytime you take away um, services like that which we had been funded from the state and then we no longer have those funds um, they have to come from somewhere so we are going to have to support our teachers we are going to have to build in supports there is no doubt about that we are going to have to have textbooks for our children and so that funding is going to have to come from one pot in order to support that other, and that's where the decrease in funding programs like that have been so impactful on student learning. Now there is a reality, shift gears a little bit, but it functions right within the framework here. You have an increasingly, uh, an increasing uh, student population of color, yet when we look at the teachers and we look at the administration, it is clear that there is a disproportionate amount of individuals who are employed in the system, which I would argue uh, is problematic to the extent that it's important for people to see at least in the mix some people that look like themselves when they're trying to engender confidence in young people. What initiative, in this going forward at least, is in place or will be in place to change that? In other words, to aggressively bring people of color, including African Americans of course, into this mix. Is there a specific thing? And if there is, what is the timetable, the projected timetable on achieving what objective? So uh, we have acknowledged that research is clearly starting to show that students having a teacher um, that looks like them impacts student learning in a very positive way. So a, a student of color having at least one teacher that is also of color has shown very positive impact on student learning. And so right now, um, there is no doubt we have a significant issue when it comes to teachers, minority teachers, uh, which right now make up about 16% of our total teacher population. We have had some major successes recently in administrators. So we're up close to about 35% in administrator 
um, with minority teach or minority administrators, which is positive. If you look at in the past six, seven months, um, well over 50% of our hires when it comes to principals and other administrators um, have been minorities. And so proud of that movement. The much more difficult task is going to be teachers. And so our philosophy in past years has been to hope, quite frankly. Let's hope that our universities um, find more candidates for us to hire. That has not worked out successfully for us, as you see the number of 16%. So we've got real work to do there. And just like all of this work that I talk about every single day, it's building a foundation that will last for years and not quick fixes. All too often in education, we expect to see quick fixes that are uh, not built on a strong foundation and we don't see the long long term successes that we need so we have to have innovative approaches and not just depend on hope that all of a sudden we get more candidates apply I believe it comes from within our own schools I believe we have, and we are working on this now we have to build our own teacher pathways in our high schools where we identify students who have an interest and the capacity to become great teachers. We work with university partners to put them in a local university immediately into a teacher education program that we actually help um, to provide incentives for them during that time. And then we sign them to a conditional contract in their freshman or sophomore year of college that says if you complete the requirements and get your certification you are guaranteed a job in JCPS we have students in our high schools 50 percent of our students are students of color so we need to start identifying those students get them on that pathway and then guarantee them a job in JCPS so that they don't leave us we believe we can do that Second of all, we are looking at some other cities who have begun a teacher residency program for teachers and for alternative paths to teaching, uh, especially focusing on minority teachers. So we have um, other uh, professions where, where people might want to be teachers. We have instructor threes, um, which are those with a um, bachelor's degree but not a teaching certification, where we can pay them to be a teacher resident, to work in a classroom over a course of the year and fast that track them for their certification and get them hired and, and pay them as long as they guarantee that they're going to be a teacher in JCPS. So we're, we're working on these innovative programs. They are not going to be a quick fix where we see an immediate impact, but what we want to do is five years from now have that 16% be 40 or 15, 40 or 50 percent of our teacher population. Now, forgive me, that sounds like a series of strategies, but I don't hear a plan. Now, I may be wrong in my assessment of that, but let me, let me rephrase it a different way. And I, and I think those are good. I like that. What is the plan? Is there a plan? If there's not a plan, will you commit to forming or formulating a comprehensive plan with goals, objectives, and timetables like plans are structured? Or did I miss that? Would you commit to that? So I guess we'd have to get into uh, the differences Semantic. between strategy and plan. Um, so yes, I will tell you my belief and my philosophy. I hire great leaders um, and a great team of leaders that um, I challenge them with the um, a task with goals in mind and say I expect to see a plan and I expect to see it implemented. If I am sitting in front of the community and holding myself accountable, which I do, and if you look at the racial equity plan, which is a part of um, hiring and our staffing is a major part of that, and it, there is a component in that that says superintendent accountability. And so usually what I tell my cabinet and people that work at central office for me is, yeah, there's superintendent accountability, but guess what rolls downhill to you too? 
That accountability will be on you too. Um, and so I expect a plan, I expect outcome measures, and I expect to see movement. Um, and so you will see that plan in the uh, racial equity plan that we provide and roll out to the community soon. Um, I would contend we have seen great, not great results, I have seen, we, I will contend we've seen positive results already. Um, but yes, I would commit to that and I think you will see that in writing in the very near future. Racial equity plan. What level of priority structurally and institutionally does the component that is responsible for advising and or I guess in some sense implementing aspects of that, what level of priority is that institutionally in JCPS? The policy itself? The policy in any aspect of it. Yeah. I would imagine part of it, correct me if I'm wrong, I would imagine part of it is to inform other parts of the system to operate differently or better or more sensitively, et cetera. And I assume that there are other parts that are actually vehicles for change, that they are actually uh, operationally, organizationally carrying out some specific undertaking. So um, that, there is no doubt about the importance of it. So I will say this. There are two aspects of um, our interaction with the Kentucky Department of Education and the whole audit process that you have probably been very aware of and heard about. So the first is the commissioner referred to it in, in his um, comments around the corrective action plan. And quite simply, most of the corrective action plan is based around compliance issues. And ensuring that we have, and I, and I want you to, to think about this, this is a challenging part for us. Ensuring that 155 schools are being compliant with laws and policies and regulations. That is no small task. It's no small task, 155. And there is a fine balance between providing oversight, that word accountability and oversight, while also being supportive and encouraging of staff members and schools to help them be successful. And we are calibrating that right now. Like we are going to do certain things that are just mandatory that there, are, there is no option for while not being that here is central office putting their thumb on you um, and doing a bunch of compliant activity. So that's compliance. The second part of it, clearly that we've heard about, is the achievement gap and issues around the achievement gap. And I have challenged our faculty and staff that whether it is the survival of our district whether that is the reason that we take on this racial equity work because of the achievement gap, or because we believe it's a moral imperative that too many of our students, especially students of color, are not being successful, either way we have to do this work. Now I believe the much greater calling is the moral imperative. We have a moral imperative that this change, that we be the leader of this nationwide, this is a problem nationwide, that we be the leader of this. And it is going to require tough work. And here's the, the context of it. Racial equity policy is not something that is an additional thing we are working on. It is woven through every single thing that we do. So I would challenge to you, the backpack of success skills is ground zero for racial equity work. It's number one, ensuring that every single student is where they need to be. So the having low expectations for students nationwide, and especially students of color, has been one of the plagues on education in America. And so having students in the classroom, and many times with teachers in schools, it comes out of compassion and empathy. We want to be successful but it's having low expectations 
and not um, expecting and demanding rigorous work and the supports that go along with that so that that can happen. And so ensuring that every student is where they are and we are providing whatever that student needs, that at the end of second grade, I just spoke to a second grade teacher in here, at the end of second grade, every student is where they need to be to be on track to be ready for middle school. And so that is the first part of it. And then the second part of it in the backpack is ensuring that all kids have opportunities for deeper learning, true relevant work uh, and learning that applies to them and engages and, and provides passion for them. So I would contend this, historically, in our schools, who's had the most access to music and to art and to robotics and to those, those programs that students become passionate about? What was it that you were most passionate about when you were in school? I'm sorry, but for most kids, it's not math class and science class and reading class. But what have we done in place when a student falls behind? We say, okay, I'm sorry you can't go to those classes. You're going to now double up in math and reading. And what happens is students become more disengaged from school instead of less disengaged. We have to do both. We have to ensure our kids have the, the math skills, the reading skills they need to be successful, but that they're also engaged and passionate in school. That's been my calling for years. And so that is ground zero of the backpack and racial equity and how they work together. Facilities, ground zero for racial equity, ensuring that our facilities, whether you are an East End school, a West End school, or a South End school, or Newburgh, or whatever community, you have the same great facilities that every other student in this school has, in this district has. Hiring, as we talked about is ground zero for equity. Training of teachers, um, ensuring that everyone, every one of our teachers has the same opportunity for training and professional development. And finally, without a doubt, what is called in there our CSI and our TSI schools, what were priority, and before that, persistently low achieving, and I'm sure they had a name before that, Whatever you want to say, I don't like the term at all, but people like to say failing schools. Let me tell you folks, they might not be getting the outcomes that they need, but the, but the teachers and staff in many of those schools are working harder than any other school in this district. That does not mean that they don't need additional supports, they do. And for the first time ever, we have a, an entire uh, central office structure um, around supporting these schools and ensuring that we have a contract that gives teachers incentives um, to work in schools, that the work might be a little more challenging or difficult. And I'm not going to say that, um, you know, it changes a teacher's life, but what I do believe is it acknowledges that teacher for the work that they are doing. It provides the opportunity for principals to make sure that the right staff is in place. Um, but all additional professional development, but our goal here right now, we had 21 CSI schools. We are going to identify another 14 or 15 schools for additional supports and putting four, five, six million dollars behind these schools to make sure they're successful because we're not going to get that funding federally anymore or from the state. So we have to do it. So I guess it, to sum all up, everything we are doing Every initiative we have, equity is a major part of that. Now, I'm a big fan of teachers. In fact, I discovered my kindergarten teacher the other day, well, a few months ago, and I plan to hook back up with her. Can you imagine that? <laughs> what an opportunity. So I'm a big fan of teachers, and we know that's where they rubber meets the road. But that's a good segue into this discussion of culture. Because I don't think that you can ignore, and I know you don't, the reality that we all live in, our historical patterns, our racial attitudes. You raised the question of expectation of our students. Uh, those who 
don't really believe that every child can learn it at high levels. Uh, how do we change that culture? You know, belief's a pretty tough thing to, to change, isn't it? So, uh, without a doubt, very challenging. Um, but I think culture is the foundation of all work in school. So I will uh, give you the example that when I went into Doss High School, about 90% free and reduced lunch, two-thirds students of color, about a third of the students in the school are either English language learners or qualify for special education services. And so, great need in the school. And um, Dr. Hargens, our former superintendent, asked me to go over there and be the principal at DOS. And my only qualification on that was I get to bring a leadership team with me because I need a leadership team with me that can implement what I want to. And so at that time going in there, the culture was not a positive, it was not a positive place for learning. Um, teachers were leaving at least a third of the staff was leaving every single year to go to other schools. And what we found, first of all, I want to define what I believe culture means in a school. I've said this many times. Culture is the attitudes and beliefs that the adults in a school bring to that school every day and how it impacts student learning. And I'll repeat that. The attitudes and beliefs that the adults bring to a school every single day and how it impacts student learning. Notice I didn't say anything about what the kids bring or the attitudes that the kids bring. We made a decision at Doss High School that we cannot control what happens outside of the school building. We cannot control what our students face before they walk in the school door or whether parents are engaged or all the other things, whether middle schools did their job and all the other things that we hear about if this happened, then we could blank. Nope, we said all we can control, we have 125 adults that come to the school every day. The only thing we can control are the attitudes and beliefs are of the 125 adults. That's it. And if we come for 175 school days with the belief that every student can learn and we will do whatever it takes to get that done, we will provide interventions for students. We will meet as much as possible as teachers and staff to plan and make sure that students have what they need. We will give students multiple opportunities to be successful. So if you fail an assessment in our school, it's not about sorry. Maybe next time, next year you'll do better. Our culture is, come on over here, we're gonna, we're gonna reteach that to you and give you that assessment again. That's right. Right. And so Ex high expectations is not, well, go do some little extra work and I hope, no, our expectations are you're going to learn it. We're going to take you there kicking, dragging, screaming, whatever it is, you're going to learn it and we're going to make sure you learn it, but we as adults are going to do whatever we have to to be successful. At the end of that year, I think we had four teachers out of the entire population leave and quite frankly because they felt like they couldn't meet those expectations. And so that's what I mean about culture. It can be done. And so often I take offense to the word failing school, which DOS was considered one and still is considered one in many people's eyes. And I would say the work being done at that school would match any others in this district, no matter what their test scores are. But that's what it requires at 155 schools. And you're right, changing culture and beliefs is not easy. That is saying to some, we have to do things differently and a leader that is committed and a team that is committed to doing that. Quite frankly, it's off-ramping some people and saying, this work is not meant for you here and we've got to find some other people that, it, that and nothing personal, but this is just difficult, tough work. Um, that is, um, you have to have a certain mindset that I'm willing to do this and come every single day to do this turnaround work um, and be committed to doing that. So. There is no secret sauce to say what you do to change culture. It requires work every single day to check people's attitudes and say, once you hit that parking lot and you're walking in the school, you have to have a mindset to say, we're willing to do whatever it takes, no matter what the students bring in the school, we are going to change lives today. We have one more question. 
But before we do that question, I want to thank uh, JCTC uh, for uh, providing the lunch today. Um, and also the facilities for us to have uh, this forum. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Sigma Pi Pi Fraternity, the uh, chapter that, uh, for their support of this particular activity. And I want to thank Galapsi uh, for the work that they do and the involvement in this particular forum. Uh, there are other organizations and groups that are involved. I apologize for not outlining all of those at this time, uh, but I did want to make note of that. And most of all, I want to thank everyone that's here. Uh, that's been, this is one of the most attentive group of people that I've had the pleasure of encountering uh, for a number of years. Uh, so you ought to give yourselves a round of applause. Quite frankly. Lastly, I want to thank all the people that were involved. Uh, I have, I, you know, the people that make this work. Uh, I could call out their names, but they do so much in terms of press relations, in terms of organization, picking up tables and chairs, uh, putting water in place, making sure that there's some sound, even when sound systems are not what we would wish in some circumstances. These are the people that really make this happen. So I get in front of a camera, but the uh, only thing I do is, you know, talk and collaborate with these very fine people. And I want to thank them for the work that they've done here today and continue to do. So for a last question, what is the timetable? What is the expectation? What can we expect to happen when you can say, when you believe at least you can say, that not only have we turned the corner, but we are well down the avenue in terms of success for our children, for the school system as a whole, our teachers, every aspect that's relevant. When do you believe that that will happen? Well, first of all, let me say this, and I haven't had the chance to say this. There are not many people that get to get in the amount of schools that I get into. Um, and I think I'm up to about 115 schools in the past 12 months. Um, and so I've got about 35 more, 40 to go. Um, and that sounds like a lot, but it's, or that I have a lot to go, but you know, usually when you go into a school, everybody wants to talk and meet, and so you're there half a day. Um, but I have the distinct and unique opportunity to be in just shortly every single school in this district. And first of all, I want to say I have been inspired by the quality of educators that we have in JCPS and the passion um, that takes place every single day. And I don't think we celebrate that enough in this community. I mean, we have 17,000 employees and the vast majority of them go to work every single day for not enough money. Many of them having other jobs um, to support that and what they want to do and all they want to see is kids be successful and all too often I talk about fixing and I don't think enough I say what what we have which are great individuals now what we have to fix is the systemic and sustained support of our district so I made a commitment with these test scores we've got some positive things but I'm not going to cherry pick a few things which we have positives until I feel that we have systemic, which means across every school, and long-term success, which means growing each and every year, um, and sustained success. And that is when we will begin to celebrate and say we have made significant progress. And so there is a, a pendulum, I say, on from one side of things where a district is essentially we have a district of schools. We have 155 schools that are almost independent contractors. Then we have the other side of the pendulum which is central office dictates everything and we say this is how you do everything. And I believe there's a happy medium in the middle. 
that we have a North Star and a focus that is systemic and guides the work that we do. And everyone follows that and we allow each and every school to develop that culture and really build how that's going to happen in their school. So we have laid that foundation. So quite simply the answer to that is this is not a start and a finish line process. We would expect and demand the community hold us accountable that we begin to see changes and results immediately. That has to happen. We have to stand up and say we have to see changes immediately. Some of those are in culture, some are in outcomes for students, some are in um, our racial equity policy. I will say, I mean, we have work to do around disproportionality with achievement, but also behavior, attendance, gifted and talented uh, identification of students. Right now, just like in many cities, about 75% of our students that are suspended are students of color. We have to change that and we have to work on that and we expect those outcomes to change quickly. We have seen in elementary schools, for instance, in the, compared to the first 30 days last year, about a drop, about 34% in suspensions in elementary schools, many of those students of color. So we need to see those changes immediately. However, we know systemic and sustained change is going to take time. Now, compliance work, corrective action, that's going to happen immediately. It's going to happen immediately, and we know we're going to have to hold people accountable for that. That 60 minutes moment when we see, when we are celebrated, is going to take time, but I'm also not willing to say that it's going to be five years, 10 years, or 15 years down the road. We expect that to happen in short term. Um, we believe in a three to five year plan that is going to make this district a model for other districts. We're committed to doing that and we believe we will see that success um, very soon and we will be celebrated as a district. And I can't wait for that opportunity when we get together and I can celebrate that 60 minutes moment with everybody in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, the superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools, Dr. Marty Polio. Thank you.